Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is on the book of Galatians. You probably know that the books of Galatians and Romans have been some of the most hotly debated books in the history of Christianity. This is lesson number six in that series for August 5 of 2017, entitled, The Priority of the Promise. Do you know what that means? Well, let's see if we can figure it out. Before we begin, however, we'd like, you to ask, I'd like to ask you to join us as we pray. Our wonderful Father, we come once again to your holy word, to the inspired messages that you gave through Paul in this case and through others in other parts of the Bible. May we understand them more clearly than we have before, and may all those who listen in participate in that blessing which comes from your Holy Spirit as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Someone once asked a politician, have you kept all the promises that you made during the campaign? He responded, yes, uh, well, at least all the promises that I intended to keep. Who hasn't at one time or another been at one end or the other of a broken promise? Who hasn't been the one to break a promise or the one to have a promise made to him or her broken? Sometimes people make a promise fully intending to keep it, but later don't. Others make a promise knowing as the sound leaves their mouths or the letters their fingers, it's all a lie. Fortunately for us, God's promises are of an entirely different order. God's word is sure and unchanging. He quote, and quote Isaiah 46, 11, I have spoken and I will bring it to pass. I have purposed and I will do it. So if we're going to talk about the surety or the priority of the promise, we need to start with God's promises, right? So now, what are the subjects? What are the questions that we have been talking about? We're talking about faith. We're talking obedience to the law. We're talking about God's promises, as that's a special emphasis in this particular lesson. And so let's read the passage from Galatians. It's found in Galatians 3, from 15 to 20. The law and the prophets, it says in my Good News Bible. My brothers and sisters, I'm going to use an everyday example. When two people agree on a matter and sign an agreement, no one can break it or add anything to it. Now God made his promises to Abraham and to his descendant. The scripture does not use the plural descendants, meaning many people, but the singular descendant, meaning one person only, namely Christ. What I mean is that God made a covenant with Abraham and promised to keep it. The law, which was given 430 years later, cannot break that covenant and cancel God's promise. For if God's gift depends on the law, then it no longer depends on his promise. So here's the, here's the question. Does God's gift depend on what he has promised, or does God's gift depend on something else? However, it was because of his promise that God gave that gift to Abraham. When, what then was the purpose of the law? And that's going to be the big question for several lessons coming up. It was added in order to show what wrongdoing is, and it was meant to last until the coming of Abraham's descendant to whom their promise was made. Now, though that verse can be translated in different ways. You've just heard one way. The law was handed down by angels with a man acting as a go-between. But a go-between is not needed when only one person is involved, and God is one. What does that imply? Well, there you have it. What are we going to do with those words? Well, the, the big question that has, or at least one of the big questions that has been, that has come about as a result of these verses is the question, can the law, and, and if so, which law can be described as being added? Was there ever a time when the law did not exist? Well, this passage, of course, is focusing primarily on the story of Abraham and God's promise to him. But haven't we been told that the law is a transcript of God's character? And what is implied by, by Mark chapter 2, verses 27 and 28, where Jesus himself said, The Sabbath was made for the good of human beings, 
They were not made for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. What does that mean? He's Lord of the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. That he's Lord of the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Okay. That means the Sabbath doesn't twist him around. Him, he, he, he twists around the Sabbath. Okay. <laughs> well, compare that with what we sometimes refer to as the Old Covenant. If you look at Genesis 19.8, then all the people answered together, we will do everything that the Lord has said. And Moses reported this to the Lord. By the way, was that before or after God had spoken to them? Before. It was before. They were already promising, oh yeah, God, just tell us whatever and we'll just do it. Well, so how did they respond after God spoke to them? What do you mean by spoke of them? Spoke to them. So what God talk I'm to talking them. about I'm what happened on, on Sinai. So are we talking about rumbles or are we talking about verbiage coming down from the mountain? We're, we're talking about people hearing God's voice. And that happened afterwards? Yes. Well, I'm, I'm saying here's what they said afterwards. <clears throat> Moses went and told the people all the Lord's commands and all the ordinances and all the people answered together, we will do everything the Lord has said. And so Moses says, okay, well, let me write it all down. He put it in a book. Then he took the book of the covenant in which the Lord's commands were written, and he read it aloud to the people. And they said, we will obey the Lord and do everything that he has commanded. This is the, uh, it obeyed Moses. <laughs> well, that's, that comes up that's in, in Joshua. In Joshua. <laughs> yeah. And what were they doing six weeks later? Dancing around with a golden calf. Dancing around a dr golden calf, drunk and naked. Well, Ellen White makes this comment. We have only glimmering light in regard to the exceeding breadth of the law of God. The law spoken from Sinai is a transcript of God's character. Okay, a transcript of God's character. What does a transcript mean? Story of the... If I want to go somewhere and take up a new profession or take up a, a, a new job or something, and they say, we need a transcript of your grades from Loma Linda University, what are they? What are they? What are they requiring? An official record. An official, verified record of what I actually did in school, right? So, what would a transcript of God's character mean? Exactly that. Yeah. A copy. It's verifiable yeah. will of God. Verifiable will of God. Okay. Many who claim to be teachers of the truth have no conception of what they are handling when they are presenting the law to the people because they have not studied it, they have not put their mental powers to the task of understanding its significance. And another place, the law, that was uh, Review and Herald, February 4, 1890. The law of love is the foundation of God's government and the service of love, the only service acceptable to heaven. God has granted wisdom I'm sorry, God has granted freedom of will to all, endowed men with capacity to appreciate his character and therefore with ability to, learn, to love him and to choose his service. So we have to understand him if we're going to love him and choose his service. So long as created beings worshipped God, they were in harmony throughout the universe. While love to God was supreme, love to others abounded. As there was no transgression of the law, which is the transcript of God's character, no note of discord jarred the celestial harmonies. Signs of the Times, February 13, 1893. So, now we're going we're gonna to try to nail down some of these issues here. At what form, in what form did Abraham have a law? Well, he had some knowledge. As okay, where did it come had, from? Well, it could have come directly from God or it could have been handled down through the patriarchs from Adam who got it from God. Yeah, so so you're, saying, you're saying that Abraham didn't know anything about the Ten Commandments? Well, that was before the... the it was before the giving of the Ten Commandments, for sure. But what about it, the angels? It, it could have been the same, much of the same thing. How did the angels know about God? The law. Well, Mount of Blessing, page one, it's one one oh nine or something like that, says it, the the idea that there was a law came to the angels as something un, unthought of. So why could they that just happen to Abraham? Well, it could. 
Oh, okay. But it does, it does say that Abraham, Genesis 26, well, this, this, that's right there in your text. The statement, Abraham kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Genesis 26, 5. So you what think was those laws what, are what, the same exact laws that that were written in stone? That's what I'm asking you. I mean, I, I'm version? I'm reading what it says there. What? <laughs> How about a different version? Like a different version, maybe. The Bible. Well, if you read these promises, just take for example this first promise to Abraham. The Lord said to Abraham, "Leave your country, your relatives, and your family's home, and go to a land that I'm going to show you." God just says, "Do that." I will give you many descendants. Who's making the promise? God. Who? God. God. And they will become a great nation. God says so. I will bless you and make your name famous so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, but I will curse those who curse you. Who's doing all the promising? God. God's doing all the promising. He did a lot of promising, but he didn't do it very fast. He <laughs> didn't do it very fast. It didn't take him very long to say those words. <laughs> Yeah, and, and we could go on Genesis 15, 18, 17, 1 to 8, and so forth. God made a lot of promises to Abraham. So Gary, was Abraham God making promises? He has to do it fast? You know, uh, God's promise. No, some of I God's just made an observation. He didn't oh. do it very fast. Some of God's <laughs> promises have taken <laughs> more than two, three thousand years. Well, there's a, an interesting passage in Jeremiah 31. Let's look at that real quick. Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. And this is called the New Covenant. The Lord says, the time is coming, and, when, and now notice who's doing the promising. I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the old covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. Although I was a like a husband to them, they did not keep that covenant. The new covenant that I will make with the people of Israel will be this. I will put my law within them, write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. None of them will have to teach his fellow citizen to know the Lord because all will know me from the least of them, least to the greatest. I will forgive their sins and I will no longer remember their wrongs. I, the Lord, have spoken. Who's doing all the promising? God. So what we see here is between the old covenant where the people were doing the promising to the new covenant where God is doing the promising, guess one, which one is more reliable? <laughs> you almost have to smile, don't you? So now we're back to the question we is talked... Is that because of sin or is that because of who we are? And who we are is because of sin, isn't it? No, I mean even before that. I mean... Is it because of of sin or because of who we are? I mean, we're not God, obviously. No. no. So we can't act like God. Well, but don't you think that if Adam and Eve had promised something to God in that perfect environment, they would have kept it? Depends what it is. Like, will I do dinner tonight or will I be perfect for the rest of eternity? Yeah. So. Okay. We brought up a question last week. And now I'm going to bring it up again. Is there a difference between a covenant, a promise, an agreement, versus a will? And what's the difference? Covenant, you're alive. A will is set up for the time when you're not alive. Okay. And, and, and anything else different between those two? Well, the other thing about a will, though, it could be a will to your, your kids, Mm -hmm. So it doesn't mean that you're, it's that you're dead, but the will transfers your belongings over to the kid, type of thing too. So um, don't you have to die to make that bring that into effect? Mm -hmm. Yes, but it depends who you're talking about, because Jesus died. And That's the point. Yeah. In the, as far as His will to us, mm -hmm. we get the. I think we're taking it more as legal terms. The first is it's an agreement between parties. It can be two people or a whole hundred or whatever. 
But a will in its simple sense is preparing for your death. Now what you're looking at is a revocable trust that we have today and there's variations on that, but that's not what you're getting at, no. I don't think. But a will doesn't do anything for you after you're dead. So it's why even do it? Person does death. So there, there is a reason why you do a will. That's to transfer yeah. your, yeah. your, your you earthly want. belongings to the, the children. And it's in a way that God is transferring his kingdom to us. It's so the, there is kind the of reason, a will kind of... So the, the reason we're discussing this is what do you think Paul had in mind? Because he says very specifically, God is one. God is one? Yeah. Right in that passage you read, he's, well, God is one. That means myself, but I may not agree with you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what do you think, put to Paul in this case, what do you think he had in mind? Why he would even say that, at mm -hmm. the, what he was going to do that. Do we need to go back and look at that? Is it like God is consistent? What was the text? Revelation 320. 320. Let's just look at it again real quick. Um, see where, okay, but a go-between is not needed when only one person is involved and God is one. So is this an agreement? Is this a covenant? Or is this a will? He seems to be implying that it's a covenant, right? That's where I read it. Yeah. In in my Bible that I have on here, which is good news, you can click on something and it expands it and says, uh, God is one or, and God acts alone. Okay, well, yeah, the same, same story. Same, same thing, it's just saying it a little differently. Abraham had been asked to follow God's covenant. He had left Ur of the Chaldees and had traveled to Haran and later proceeded on from Haran to Canaan. He had no official property of his own. Wouldn't you say that there must have been a significant relationship? And I guess that property is a question of how you'd interpret that because this guy had an enormous amount of wealth, a thousand people working for him, etc. But he didn't have a property except the first property, actual land that he purchased was so he could bury Sarah. Well, there are several very important points that Paul wanted to make about this agreement and about the later commandments given by, from Mount Sinai. First of all, I want to make it clear that the promises God made to Abraham were in no way modified or nullified by anything that happened later, including the giving of the commandments at Sinai. So he's saying, God has this agreement with Abraham. They have this covenant. Abraham dies. Hundreds of years go by. Can someone else come along and say, no, that agreement that you made together doesn't, doesn't count anymore? can't do that, right? Not legally. Well, was, a, the, was the um, promise made just to Abraham, or was it to his, his descendant? His, his descendant. also. Yeah, to his descendant, one. Descendant. That's what it says. Well, Ellen White commenting on Genesis 3.15 says this, here was the first promise of a savior who would stand in the field of battle to contest the power of Satan and prevail against him. Christ came to our world to represent the character of God as it is represented in his holy law. For his law is a transcript of his character. Christ was both the law and the gospel. The angel that proclaims the everlasting gospel, Revelation 14, 6, proclaims the law of God. For the gospel of salvation brings men to obedience of the law, whereby their characters are formed after the divine similitude. So that, that's found in, um, the easiest place probably is Christ Triumphant, page 339, paragraph 2, but there's some other places. And you might find it interesting to look at some of these questions that we put together for our discussion. They're found in our website at theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, not dot com, dot O-R-G, Theox, T-H-E-O-X, dot O-R-G. So if the law is a transcript of God's character, and if the angels in heaven found it surprising that there ever was such a thing as a law, Mount of Blessing, page 109, doesn't that imply that the law is everlasting? 
was the law spelled out in the days of Noah or Adam or at least earlier in the experience of Abraham? What we find is this. We keep making mistakes and we keep failing and God keeps adding laws. Is that a good plan? Well, we see that in our government. <laughs> oh, really? Instead of Ten Commandments, we have, you know, it's kind of the, the ruining it for the rest of us effect. So something, somebody does something that's so out of the ordinary that they have to make a law so that it isn't many, done again. Many, many years ago, a uh, famous radio commentary by the name of Paul Harvey said, and I, I don't remember these numbers exactly, but I'll get it probably. The Ten Commandments are like 250 words or something like that, and the Gettysburg Address is 150 words or something like that, and the latest, and this was probably in the 1980s, the latest uh, regulations for the export of duck eggs from the European community was 5,000 or something like that. <laughs> I mean, you just, you talk about multiplying words. Well, which one is more important? Must be the one with more words, huh? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Did Adam and Eve have any laws? They were told not to go to the tree, tree, the uh, knowledge of good and evil. Well, here's a very incredible statement. It's found in a number of places, but the most easily accessible is Patriarchs and Prophets, page 364. If man had kept the law of God, now that's what we're talking about, right? The law of God? If man had kept the law of God as given to Adam after his fall, preserved by Noah, and observed by Abraham, there would have been no necessity for the ordinance of circumcision. So where did the law fail between Adam and Judah? And if the descendants of Abraham had kept the covenant, who was that, Isaac, was that Judah? Of which circumcision was a sign, they would never have been seduced into idolatry. Which one of them was seduced into idolatry? All of them. Now what, what? All of them. All of them? You know, sometimes what we forget is this. We, we, we mentioned the key men down the line. But what, what do we know about who Jacob married? I'm sorry, not Jacob. Well, we know about the four wives of Jacob. What about Judah? Who did Judah marry? Well, his, at one time. his illegitimate daughter-in-law, wife, who yeah. bore him his two sons, was a Canaanite. But his wife that bore him children original was also a Canaanite. Who did Benjamin marry? A Canaanite. Who did Joseph marry? An Egyptian princess. I mean, the only, the only wives that we know about where they came from of all of the sons of Judah, uh, of Jacob, were all foreign women. What does that say about how they raised their families? Does that have something about to do with how they were seduced into idolatry? We usually think those were the saints, right? The patriarchs. The patriarchs. Well, not quite. Patriarchs are probably, well... Does patriarchs mean the people before the flood? or Anyway, nor would it have been necessary for them to suffer a life of bondage in Egypt. So their sins apparently led to the bondage in Egypt. They would have kept God's law in mind. They didn't, apparently. And there would have been no necessity for it to be proclaimed from Sinai or engraved upon the tables of Son. No necessity. Why was it necessary? Because they were doing things that they shouldn't have been doing. Or you don't need to make a law about against something that is Nobody's not doing practice if there's nothing going on. And had the people practiced the principles of the Ten Commandments, there would have been no need of the additional directions given to Moses. Patriarchs and Prophets, C64. That's an incredible statement. Okay, well now let's talk about how that might affect us. If God's plan of salvation is based on justification alone, and, that, and to many people that means forgiveness alone, and has nothing to do with the observance of law, why was the giving of a law necessary? But it wasn't for forgiveness. The law is not for forgiveness. No. The law is for education. 
But if all you need is forgiveness, what's the point of the law? Pointless. Because you, everybody's forgiven. So did the law have only a temporary application, as many of our Christian friends claim? No, so, the law is just a description of the way things work. And that's a different paradigm than traditionally is... is we're going to get to that point in a moment. But a little few verses down later that we haven't read so far, in verse 24 of Galatians 3, it says, And so the law was in charge of us until Christ came. That's one translation. What it says literally in the Greek is, unto Christ. It could also mean to bring us to Christ. So is it until Christ came, or is it to bring us to Christ? See, so if it tell until Christ came, as many of our Christian friends would want it to say, that means once Christ comes, you don't need the law anymore. Which part of the law don't we need anymore? Well, in well, reality, we don't need the law. Because if we had love, we would not need the law. And that's why they did not have a law for a long time, because they knew what love was. We lost track of what love is, and now we need a law to take us back to what love should produce, which is what the law tells us to do. So this is using a human system of control, of social control, as opposed to God's system of social control. God's system is a principle of life, which is God's law, if we have that principle of life, which is love, we don't need a law anymore because which one of the Ten Commandments would we break if we had true love in our hearts? Yeah. But because we're fallible, the law can be a feedback mechanism to tell That's us it. when yeah, we're, we're no, not walking it. in love. Yeah. Well, what was so. it, how would you see God before Jesus? Isn't the law kind of... Well, you, you, I'm talking about the they, Ten Commandments. I'm not they saw him on top of the mountain. No, they were, they had their faces in the dirt. What do you, what do you, what do you study oh, I see. to find out what God is? Well, before Jesus... They you, had the Old Testament. Really had the, well, plus you had the Ten Commandments because yeah. that was, the, char that was the, um, the document that gave you the character of God. Okay. And then when Jesus came, we actually had a live person to look at. Mm -hmm. And they wrote about him, and we can look about what he did in his life. So actually, Jesus is superior than the, to the law because the law is only words, yeah. Yeah. Whereas, yeah. Yeah. whereas he actually lives well, something. Many of our Christian friends believe that the law given at Sinai, otherwise known as the Ten Commandments, was only applicable from the time of Sinai until the death of Christ. So which part of that law do they want to sort of lay a set aside? There's only one. There's only one part of it, yeah. Well, what, what, in Romans 2, 14 and 15, when those who do not have the law do what the law requires so that the law is written on their heart. In other words, the way that they think is, is uh, the correct way. So uh, even though they didn't have the Ten Commandment law, it's yeah. love, love is fulfilling of the law, isn't that the way it goes? Like that? So what happens here is this. <coughs> they look at the Ten Commandments, our Christian friends look at the Ten Commandments, and they say, well, the first one makes sense, just, you know, and the second one makes sense, and the third one makes sense. That fourth one, we're not too sure about it. And the other six, yeah, those pretty much make sense. So. We think that nine of the ten makes sense, so we'll just leave out the one that doesn't make any sense to us. Is that a it's fair? Some number by different methods you're yeah. referring to the Sabbath. Or I'm talking about the Sabbath command. Or they move it to Sunday. In other words, yeah. God changed it to what he means for us is, is Sunday. So that's how they would change it. The other w way is to take away the second commandment, idols, certain section of yeah. Christianity. Christianity and divide the tenth one into two, so you still have ten. Okay, well, let's think about what happened at Sinai just briefly because our time keeps running. God came down on that mountain. There was thunder, there was lightning, there was black smoke. I mean, and they were, I mean, that mountain isn't that tall. I don't know which mountain it was, but none of the mountains that have been suggested that as possibly being the mountain that Mo Moses went up to and God came down on. None of them are more than, you know, three or four thousand feet above the, the ground at that, at that point. 
So, I mean, they could see very clearly up there what was going on. And a voice came thundering out of that cloud and gave them the Ten Commandments. And what happened to them? They stood afar off and with their faces in the dirt. What was God trying to do? Teach them. Teach slaves. Teach them that he's much greater than they are, for one thing. Would that make you want to run up and give them a hug? Well, that wasn't the point of that. <laughs> well, I mean, let's, you know, and, and I'm not trying to be funny here. Jesus came 1,500 years later, and here he is teaching the people, and I quote, the poorest and humblest were not afraid to approach him. Even little children were attracted to him. They loved to climb upon his lap and to kiss that pensive face benignant with love. Testimonies, volume 3, page 422. And in another place, she said they would, they would come and sit in his lap even while he's teaching the crowds. Here the, the kids are trying to climb on his lap while he's teaching. Now, what happened between Sinai and that? Well, our sins have separated us from God, but, <laughs> yeah. uh, which yeah. is what Sinai was kind of about, to mm -hmm. see, see what the gulf really is. You know, it's not just, well, I'll forgive you and th then we're okay. There's this huge gulf, and Jesus is uh, the mediator of the New Covenant, as New Testament says. Mm -hmm. and so he's the one who, who is Emmanuel. God with us who comes close and, and is able to bridge that gap. He's mm -hmm. Jacob's ladder, so to speak, the yeah. bridge between heaven and, and earth. Okay, now last week we talked about Abraham and his experience and think about his relationship to God. And we, most of us would probably say, maybe without full understanding, say, well, if we could just have the kind of relationship that Abraham had with God, we would be fine, right? Abraham seemed to be a friend of God, right? So, in light of that, Abraham didn't have the law, he'd never heard of the Ten Commandments, but his Fred suggested he loved God, and he did what was right because he loved God. And God gave him this, I mean, there in the scriptures it just says, he obeyed God's commandments, whatever that included. And is commended as being yeah. righteous yeah. for doing yeah. so. We, we could replace it with God. Uh, he obeyed or he respected God's way of life, which is the only commandment, you might say, the only principle that makes it possible for anyone in the universe to have life, which is with love. Abraham understood God's principle of life. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so now, I'm going to pose you a question right now. Suppose that you are responsible, you have a couple million people you just brought out of slavery, and there they are waiting for you to speak at the bottom of Mount Sinai. Which one of the Ten Commandments would you leave out, or would you leave out any of them? Would you dare to leave out any of them? So they, every, there's a good reason for every one of them. Is that what we're saying? Yes. Yeah. They weren't arbitrary. Yeah. Now, Gordon has suggested to us in the past that there were more, there's more than one kind of law. There are what we call descriptive laws, and there are proscriptive laws. What's the difference between a descriptive law and a proscriptive law? Pro, proscriptive is to proscribe. In other words, make something, don't, don't do it. Yeah. Or... A descriptive is description of the way things work, the way all intelligent creatures will conduct themselves for eternity. That's the law of love. Okay. So a descriptive law, a very common example of descriptive law that everybody understands somewhat, somewhat is the law of gravity. Any of you know any time where there's been a violation of the law of gravity? Gravity. When an airplane takes off, is that a violation of the, of the law of gravity? No, it's application of other laws. It's application of you know balancing laws and so forth. And when you get enough lift in the plane, though it overcomes the weight of the airplane, then it goes off the ground, right? So the proscriptive law, a typical example of a proscriptive law, would be the government saying, you know, the, the speed limit on the freeway is 60 miles an hour or 
80 or and the fact that it's arbitrary is because sometimes it says 55 and sometimes it says 80. So that's clearly arbitrary. So what not about God's law? Arbitrary, but what? Not quite arbitrary. Well, no, not quite more, arbitrary. A little arbitrary. more arbitrary. Okay. So <laughs> God's laws are they descriptive or proscriptive? Descriptive. Descriptive. You all agree with that? In fact, Young's literal translation says, in Exodus 20, he says, you, thou dost not steal, thou dost not, in other words, uh, commit adultery, thou mm -hmm. doesn't uh, covet, and so forth. Uh, it's, it's describing, in the future, the way intelligent creatures will conduct themselves. How does, how does understanding that description of God's laws impact our relationship to him? thought about that? If it's God up there saying, I want you to do this, and you have to do this, and you have to do this, and you have to do this, that, that suggests one kind of relationship. But if God is saying, if you want to live, you will do this, you will do this, you will do this, you will do this, and, we, and he and, and encourages us to think it through and think for ourselves and recognize, yeah, that's the right thing to do. That's also prescriptive. Yes, well, that's a little different. It's a prescription. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you're free to choose mm -hmm. to not uh, comply. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 is that right? Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah. Well, you could say if you have love, you will not kill. If you had love, you wouldn't lie. If you had love, you wouldn't, or you would do some of these things. So it's all a matter of what happens when there's love in your heart, and that's the law of God is love. <laughs> okay. Does keeping the commandments change us? No. And that's the whole problem with Galatians. He, in Galatians, we have a contrast here. It, which law are we talking about? Mm -hmm. that's the legal the, that's system the we're getting to. Yeah, the legal system cannot save us. Okay. Well, I didn't ask whether it would save us. I, the, my question was, does it change us? Does it make us healthier, happier, holier? Does it change the heart? Yeah. Because you saying? could keep the law and makes you better and healthier and without it changing your heart. Yeah, that's possible. It makes me happier, healthier, and holier if I don't kill someone, if I don't lie to someone, if I don't cheat, and so on. Mm -hmm. it makes it pretty hard to keep that tenth one, though. That's right. <laughs> but we can still... Well, so let's, let's apply this to a principle, a Christian principle. Does justification change us? I'm using one of those long Latin words now. Depends what we mean by justification. And that's why we, we spend hours and hours yes. chewing the fat on it, isn't it? Becoming just, and that's why Tyndale invented the word righteousness. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of becoming just, not a matter of being justified, in other words. Okay, so let's, let's come to a word that we understand more clearly. Okay. Salvation. Okay. Healing. Does salvation change us? Well, salvation means healing. Yes. What's it, what the healing? A pancreatic cancer condition? Or the way you think about God? Yeah, no, the way we think about God. So let's, let's, let's think about this for a moment. We talk about justification by what? Works. Or by faith. I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> we talk about justification by faith. We talk about sanctification by? Faith. 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 We talk about salvation by? What's the common ingredient? Faith. Faith. Which is does, what? Does faith change us? If a belief system of God, which should be our faith, would change us because that belief system would be a belief system founded on love. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it would change us. God is love. Mm -hmm. yes. So, are we, exa are, we, are we changed by accepting the righteousness of Jesus Christ? Are, are, in other words, do, do we just sort of accept that and we wear it like a cloak? Or does a change actually take place in us? Does God intend for us to be changed? And then, yes. Yeah. By well, beholding, we become changed. And yeah. we see the light of the glory of God, His character in the face of Jesus Christ. He's, through the okay. Spirit, through Jesus, we are okay. restored to a relationship with God, and He's the giver of all good gifts. So, okay. anything uh, we have, it comes. Good thing comes from Him. 
I want to be very careful, but let's think about this very carefully. Are the people who enter heaven just forgiven or just justified, or are they changed? Changed. Healed. Well, all of the above, you could say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Because so will heaven, be po on the ladder. Will, <laughs> will heaven be populated with pardoned crooks? No. no. But there is such thing as willingness to be changed. Yeah. The thief on the cross was a crook, you might say. He's going to be in heaven. Why? Because God knows the heart and knows that his principle of life, his law, is going to affect the way he understands life. I heard a, a very, he would, re, would roll over in his grave if he heard me say this. What I would regard as somewhat of a legalistic theologian say, God gives his, when talking about justification and sanctification, he would say, God gives his gifts with two hands. You can't just get justification without sanctification. You can't get sanctification without justification. God gives his gifts with two hands. What do you think that means? Do, do, when we get justification, when we get forgiveness, is that the beginning of sanctification? Well, well Romans five depends 10. on what we do with it. With the reception of the Holy Spirit, it's the beginning of life eternal. So mm -hmm. uh, it opens the channels to receive from God. And uh, sanctification is uh, also holiness. <coughs> that, uh, we are dedicated to God. Something uh -huh. that is dedicated to God is considered holy. So if uh -huh. we dedicate mm -hmm. ourselves... Mm -hmm. How much do you think Paul knew about justification and sanctification? He, he never heard the words. words. Never heard those words in his life. Well, here's what he did say. It was recorded in the book of Acts, chapter 16, verse 31. This is talking about the Philippian jail, where Paul and Silas are there. And, and remember, they, there was that earthquake, and they were freed. All the prisoners were freed, and the... Jailer wanted to kill himself because he was sure that he would be held responsible for all these escaped prisoners. And Paul said, don't worry, we're all here. And he came in with his light and looked around. Yeah, they're, they're all there. And so he says, what do I have to do to be saved? And Paul said, let me see, uh, 20 doctrines, or 28 is it now? 610 laws. <laughs> no, he said, have faith in the Lord Jesus, or as my version says, believe. It was the same word in Greek. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your family. Is it possible to be saved by faith alone? Yes. Sounds like it, doesn't it? It depends what we understand by the word faith. Absolutely. Again. Well, we're dead in our trespasses, so what can a dead person do? <laughs> that's a good be, question. We have to be brought to life, and that's what uh, happens when we... we uh, so you know what I'm going to come back to next. What does keeping of the law have to do with faith? Or does faith do away with law? Now we have to go to Romans chapter 3, verse 31. And what does it say there? Are you experts? God forbid. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does this mean that by this faith we do away with the law? No, not at all. My good news Bible says the, the, the Greek is me genoita, you know, perish the thought or God forbid. Instead, we uphold the law. So now, where are we? Would it be correct to say that the Ten Commandments have almost nothing to do with our salvation? Makes us aware of our need to... Uh flee to Jesus for, for righteousness. You all have mirrors at your house, mm -hmm. and you use them. Do they help you to clean your face, for example? Shows us well, what we need to be clean. <laughs> it, it just shows us what we need to do, doesn't it? It's not soap. There's this, uh, back to Galatians uh, 9, it's going to be uh, 3.19. Uh -huh. Why then the law... And my RSV says it was added because of transgression. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Would it be safe to say it was stated because of transgression? You don't need to state a law if there's nobody violating the law. Yeah. 
Uh, does that make sense? If no one's breaking it, if no one, you know, if no one's violating it, you don't need a law. If nobody's <coughs> if nobody's uh, uh, doing anything else wrong, then you don't need to raise that issue. Well, there are those who just always are trying to find a way around the law. Yeah, you know, that's the mission. And then you add a few laws to try to fill those you know, fill those the, holes and fill those holes, and then people try to find another way around the law. Yeah. So. Well, there are many circumstances under which following God's commandments literally preserves us from destruction. And here's Ellen White's comment. Well, this is actually from our Bible commentary, volume 6, page 510. Moreover, genuine faith implies in itself an unreserved willingness to fulfill the will of God in a life of obedience to His law. Real faith, based on wholehearted love for the Savior, can lead only to obedience. Ellen White said something sort of similar. Let us relate ourselves to God in self-denying, self-sacrificing obedience. That would be obedience to the law, right? Faith in Christ always leads to willing, cheerful obedience. He died to redeem us from all iniquity and to purify unto himself a peculiar people as zealous of good works. There is to be perfect conformity in thought, word, and deed to the will of God. Heaven is only for those who have purified their souls through obedience to the truth. Okay. How does that work? That's found in Our Father Cares, page 247, paragraph 5. So if in fact justification by faith or forgiveness, as some would say, means that we are no longer need the law, would it then be all right to commit adultery, murder, steal, tell lies, etc.? If you're just justified, you all remember, or some of you remember, the story of a certain evangelist who was very, TV evangelist, very well known, was caught committing adultery down in Palm Springs. And he said, no problem, I sinned under the law. What does that mean? He's covered. It's okay. Sinned under, I, I, I've but I did it under the blood. Isn't that how you, how you stated it? Yeah, I think. I did, yeah. Is that what I said? No, maybe I didn't. I think he. I think he. Uh, Sin under the blood. Wasn't the law given to protect us from just such things happening until we become mature enough to realize that it is best to do right because it is right? Does this help us to understand why James called it the law of liberty? And here's the very heuristic statement from Ellen White, the man who attempts to keep the commandments of God from a sense of obligation merely because he's required to do so will never enter into the joy of obedience. In fact, he does not obey. When the requirements of God are accounted a burden because they cut across human inclination, we may know that the life is not a Christian life. True obedience is the outworking of a principle within. Fred, what's the principle? Love, right? It springs from the love of righteousness, the love of the law of God. The essence of all righteousness is to do right because it is right, because right doing is pleasing to God. Christ Object Lessons, 90, the bottom of 97, the top of 98. So the difference is either we do what the law says because it says that we should do it, which is righteousness by works, or we do it because we have so much of the love of God in our heart that we even reach a point where we don't think about doing wrong. And that's the Tenth Commandment. Yeah. In other words, we, we have come to understand that everything God asks us to do is really for our best good. That's right. We, we always suffer when we violate God's laws. When the Jews in Jesus' day referred to the Law and the Prophets, what, what were they talking about? What we call the Old Testament. Well, we, and I'm racing on because we're running out of time. Um, they, they at, at, at minimum, thought of the entire five books of Moses as being the Torah, the law. It wasn't just the Ten Commandments by any stretch of the imagination. So, uh, while modern Christians often think it's just the Ten Commandments, we know that it includes much more than that. Did Paul tell us specifically what law he was speaking about in Galatians 
No. The same question comes up in Romans 5, 13 and 20. Ellen White wrote quite specifically on this subject, subject and, and you probably all know those passages. One of the clearest places in, is in Volume 1 of Selected Messages, page 233 and 234, and it's good to read right on to 235. Surely Paul was not trying to suggest that the law was added to the Abrahamic covenant in such a way as to modify it in some way. The law had been in existence long before Sinai. But the relationship that God had with Abraham when he gave his covenant was very different from the relationship he had with the ex-slaves just coming out of Egypt. The ex-slaves needed clear and specific detailed directions. The law was never intended to be a recipe for salvation. However, it does clearly point out sin, right? So it is it the, is it the moral law of the ceremonial that is, that is more specifically points out the sins. Well, both. Well, not so, so much, the but the moral. The moral. The more of the moral law, right. Yeah. The ceremonial law simply adds many detailed instructions about how different portions of the moral law are to be carried out. The laws are act as a magnifying glass, one theologian said. The device does not actually increase the number of dirty spots that defile a garment, makes them stand out more clearly and reveals more, many more of them than one is able to see with the naked eye. So it seems that the Galatians and especially the Judaizing Christians who had gone to Galatia needed to reorient their thinking. What about us? Do we need a paradigm shift? We must be born again. So coming to the question, back to the question again of which law was being specifically referred to as being added, what should be our answer? Well, part of the issue we need to think of is the context. Any, anything out of its context can be misunderstood. In the days of Paul, in fact, two or three hundred years before Paul, Alexander the Great conquered the world. And when the Romans took over, they more or less adopted and accepted the Greek ideas until sometime later they just sort of decided they needed, didn't need to do that anymore. But basically... Um, the Greeks believed that they didn't want to just conquer the world and let everybody else be slaves and serve them. They said, you all need to become Greeks. You need to speak the Greek language. You need to accept Greek culture. You need to build your cities according to Greek plans. Everything needs to be done in a Greek way. Everybody, the Greek way is obviously superior to every other way, so just do it the Greek way. And that was, that was his attitude. They call it Hellen Hellenistic. Yes, so that, that process is called Hellenization or Hellenistic. Hellenized, to be Hellenized. And among the Jews, remember that the, 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 the Sadducees were very close to the Roman government. And they thought, let's just, let's just go with the flow. Why, why do we need to fight the thing? So there was, a, there was a horse, many people don't realize this, there was a horse racing track almost next to the temple in Jerusalem. There was all kinds of stuff. The, they're, they're, the maps, the oldest maps we have show that the main streets, in Jeru even in Jerusalem, were oriented according to the Greek recommendations. So the, the, and the, and the, the Sadducees had a lot of control. But then the Pharisees and the Essenes say, away with all that, we're going to go back to our Jewish laws and our Jewish customs because that's the thing we need to do. So who won out in that argument? Well, let's, let's talk about that for a moment. Who is the most famous Pharisee of all? Paul. Paul, an ex-Pharisee, to be honest. But do we know any other Pharisees? Yes. Nicodemus. Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea, Simon the former leper, probably Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, who were his nieces and nephew. So we know quite a few of them. Well, does the fact that Paul suggested that the law was added mean that it did not exist prior to Sinai? Well, we've talked about a lot of those issues. If God says, if God regarded Abraham as his, as his friend and says he was keeping the commandments, what commandments was he keeping? Well, are they suggesting that after the death of Christ it is okay to commit adultery? And our Christian friends kill, steal, or lie? Of course not. We've already talked about this. 
They just want to get rid of the fourth commandment. They don't think it's necessary anymore. So what did Christ actually do to deal with, with sin? And let me just read this verse. We don't have time to uh, really go, to, go into it in any detail. But Romans 8 verse 3 says, What the law could not do, and that means no matter how well you kept it, because human nature was weak, God did. He condemned sin in human nature by sending his own son who came with a nature like sinful human nature to do away with sin. So how did the life and death of Jesus do away with sin? And before we run out of time, I'm going to, I want to read a couple more things. No one can doubt the impressive display that God put on on Mount Sinai. Did it convince the children of Israel to carefully observe all of his requirements for years to come? We know the answer to that. Six, months, six weeks later, they were dancing drunk and naked around a golden calf. There are a number of places in Scripture, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, suggesting that love is the fulfillment of all, of all law, and we've already looked at some of those. Many Christians make a great deal out of the fact that Jesus is our mediator. Where did that idea come from? Well, the children of Israel asked for a mediator at the foot of Mount Sinai. How did Abraham manage to develop such a good relationship with a God at a, at a time when there was no Bible, there was no churches, there were no pastors, no prophets? Well, we suggested that maybe he had a very good relationship to God and kept in constant communion with God. Finally, I think we have to agree with Paul that the giving of the law, the Ten Commandments, and the ceremonial laws about 430 years after the original agreement with Abraham did not invalidate that agreement or modify it in any way. We should also agree with Paul that the law still serves as an excellent guide for human behavior. When, when held up like a mirror alongside our behavior, it quickly points to areas where we need help. For those of us who believe and accept the larger view, great controversy, trust, healing model of the plan of salvation, that's really talking about the great controversy, the life and death of Jesus have, been, have given us a clear picture of the kind of person God is and the devastating results of sin. God's law spells out the nature of sin in, in more detail. It is only by studying and med meditating on the life of Christ by allowing the Holy Spirit to work in our lives that we can be transformed to become like Jesus. And that's, of course, what we all would like to do because that is the way we have a chance of entering the gates of heaven. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for this brief opportunity we've had to look once again at these horrendous statements, these momentous statements in the book of Galatians in the third chapter. Why then the law? Why was it given? Why did you use so much use of law? What kind of a God would make so much use of law? These are the questions we need to have answered for ourselves and to our own satisfaction. And may that be true as a result of our discussion today is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <music>